Um, I appreciate that I'm in between you and beer, so I'm doing the slightly shorter version today. Um, what I would like to talk to you about today is um, config management. It's always it's all about development, but at um, my experience internally at customers, it's we don't actually apply uh, software um, best practices in software development. So uh, I should explain this a bit more. I, when I went to university, I tried to become a molecular biology. First of all, I sold my soul to the dark side and went into pharma. Uh, then I sold my, my soul to the dark side to become a dev, to do um, bioinformatics. Then in the end, in, go into academia. Um, when you are the developer, you're, all of the, uh, you're also the server guy. So that's how I came to sell my soul to the dark side and became an ops guy. Um, so that's why I was surprised that when we do config management, we don't actually use most of the um, the best practices in software develop, uh, development that we've learned over the years. Um, because I don't know for the people who it's hard to see. So who who wrote Puppet Code before and isn't ashamed that he wrote similar code like this? It's basically procedural code. It goes from top to bottom, although it not necessarily gets. Uh, run that way, although uh, Eric today explained that it should in the way we, we hope. Um, it's basically procedural, you go from top to bottom, we install some stuff, and if something needs to change, we basically need to go back into our code and change them. Um, of course, everybody writes um, abstract stuff into Hira so that um, at least some of the most basic stuff, like your passwords, are actually in Hira or hopefully in Vault or some other secret management tool. Um, if you look at this as a developer, it's pretty much, uh, it's basic. And um, you're not, um, it's not very good. People at Puppet in the community, they, they also realized this. And in 2012, a guy, K. Crackdown, came up with a standard pattern to abstract code. Um, Something that we now call component modules is basically the stuff we recognize as modules for the people that write Puppet code. Uh, it basically it organizes, it describes, it models uh, standard technology and hopefully in such an abstracted way that it can be used on many operating systems for mostly for most use cases. He came up with the idea of profiles. Profiles basically uses um, component modules um, to do it our way. That's mostly the, the simple stuff the way it is described. And then you have roles. Roles are, are things that map not physical nodes or virtual nodes onto uh, business roles. So if some guy, person in business comes to you and kind of goes, I need a web server, I need a database, and that's basically the role he recognizes. Um, summarize the TLDR. Resource uh, components, uh, resource definitions, profiles as your specific way of doing stuff. Um, roles is uh, a way to map business roles. Um, if you, most of us have abstracted the original puppet code I showed into similar like this. Um, class, roles, web server, two profiles, um, job done. Um, some of them actually, uh, we came, came up with, but the database needs more hardware, so we're splitting it out, and then all of a sudden we had three worlds. Web server, the all-in web server, the web server, and the database. Um, this grows old really fast, it becomes unmanageable, it's basically a lot of re-implementation all over again. Um, so, again, community had to think about what was going next. There were a couple of natural patterns involved which uh, Puppet Labs conveniently described in, I think the last I found was in their, their professional product in the 2017.3 release. And there's several ways of doing this, especially granular roles that the one I showed. Uh, we have an all-in-one, we have a web server, every database, we have um, uh, other roles. Uh, the, the one that explodes most quickly and probably everybody recognizes is the Puppet Master. First, it's an all-in-one. 
Um, so we have our foreman, we have our puppet DB, we have our puppet master, and then all of a sudden it starts to split out. Like we take the puppet DB out, we take foreman onto another, or the dashboard onto another server. And then we all of a sudden have six rules that are pretty much doing the same thing or parts of the same thing. Uh, then next one is the one where we have conditional logic. So we, we decide we have one rule and then we go if this, if this, if this, then this. Um, it's nice and neat in one class, but it basically adds complexity because you have to test for all of your, your permutations. If the first one is uh, Boolean false, second one Boolean true, um, like this, the matrix of permutations you should test but probably don't actually ex explode pretty quickly. The other one is nested roles, where you go, I have a web server, on top of that I have a role that inherits the web server that also adds uh, actual additional functionality like my actual runtimes or my database. Um, the last one that the community pretty quickly decided wasn't the right way forward was uh, multiple roles. So pro actually what it pretty much did was assign multiple profiles to a role. Of a 2A node, and therefore um, uh, that way cl classify the node. Uh, you can still see this behavior in Foreman. You can pretty easily click together um, a, yeah, a role for a server. They don't call it roles, but that's pretty much what it does. It goes include class, include class, include class, include class. Um, Fifth one, super profiles. That's the one that we mostly come across. It's um, profile web server, includes profile Apache, includes profile PHP, profile firewall. Um, and that actually it gets you in trouble with, with abstractions. And actually a lot of code reuse as well. Um, and actually the sixth one is pretty much the same as the, the, the multiple profiles per, uh, per node. Uh, and that, when I saw this many customers many times over, I actually saw, uh, that made me come up with this quote again. I still can't work out who, who to attribute to it to, but it basically says loose coupling, uh, high cohesion is pretty much going to solve most of your development problems. Um, it means that you should be able to shop around and mix and match or pick and mix uh, components pretty quickly but you should have a high, um, they should be able to work together quite well, or, and you shouldn't be able to pull them from uh, all over your, uh, your code base. You should be pretty much adjacent or at the same instruction level. Um, then that's basically the original, we, we sw switch back to the original one. Um, well, in this talk, we're gonna build this one out, basically. It's gonna be, um, this has, um, it has, a, yeah, no, we're going to build this one out. That's basically it. Um, I went back to my little then still uh, paper library and went, uh, went back to read the Bibles about uh, design patterns. Uh, it's, if you have a couple of weeks for, oh, left over, then you should really read these. Um, and one of the patterns I came across, and that's what basically um, triggered me to look into this further, was the model view controller. It's another three-step uh, design pattern. Uh, it comes across, comes over from the um, object-oriented uh, world. And it has, again, three, three levels of, of ideas. It has the model, that's basically where the, um, all the work happens, that's where the, your business logic is. You have the controller that converts input to either commands that go into your models or it, it feeds stuff to your view. And the view is basically the presentation layer. Um, if we TLDR that one, it's model does your heavy lifting, your controller does your logic flow, your view does your consumable render. Uh, and that, if you compare the two TLDRs, they get pretty close. Um, we have a model that maps quite nicely onto components. We have our profiles that sort of map onto controllers. And basically, business role that maps pretty much on um, of a consumable uh, 
thing that business recognizes. It's not necessarily um, the actual view that you recognize from model in, in your view. So it's, it's, a, it's a model of a form that gets rendered or a table that gets rendered. But it's something that the business recognizes. Uh, and as I said, it's taken from object-oriented programming. Um, pretty much any language does it now, uh, except for the functional fans out here. Um, it basically, it uses objects and classes. Uh, objects are instances of classes. Um, and you can pass around lots of stuff. You have encapsulation, you have inheritance, uh, you can ha even have polymorphism, which is, um, it looks a lot the same, but it's a different version of it. And you can actually recurse through stuff, which is something that when I wrote this originally, but couldn't do still. And why I'm introducing object-oriented stuff? Because one of the major um, principles in object-oriented is the solid principle. And it's an acronym of five design principles that by themselves are uh, things to aspire to, but as a whole will make sure that your uh, software is designed understandable, flexible, and maintainable. Um, so next, we'll, uh, we'll walk through the, the five steps. Um, so as I said, it's an acronym. The S stands for Single Responsibility Principle. We have the Open and Close Principle, Leskov Substitution Principle, and um, some other stuff. So let's, let's review those in a bit more fancy way. The Single Responsibility Principle basically says we have a class should only have one and have one and only one reason to exist or to change. So if you look back at um, our original old school puppet code, we pretty much see immediately this is, uh, this is wrong. Um, if my PHP, if you decide to go for my SQL to, to Postgres, my class needs to change. If you go from PHP to some other runtime, my class needs to change. And that's weird because I just want an Apache. Uh, so why would I need to go near my code that does install Apache to update my database? It makes no sense. Um, so we have, and that's basically the first principle I already showed. We split it up into stuff that is uh, no longer, um, well, that can be logically split out as, for instance, my MySQL database is probably the first uh, thing to go from your web server because when people show up, you, that's where your load is going to be. Next principle, open and close. Um, and this is where uh, object-oriented reasons for, P for Puppet go off the rails, because of course Puppet is not an object-oriented language. But uh, let's see how far we can get. You should be able to extend any class um, without modifying it. You should be able to extend the, the behavior of a class without actually having to modify it. Um, in object-oriented stuff, it's pretty easy. You, you, are, you have abstracts, you have interfaces, you have inheritance, and that's how you sort this out. In Puppet, as I said, we don't have any of that. Um, so first of all, we go, this is my, my profile Apache. We go in and basically, um, we go in and we modify, it's the last two lines basically where we're focusing on anything that could change for some reason. Um, for instance, uh, I run X websites on my server now, X n plus one. Um, I need to add it, and that's basically uh, easy to do now by using create uh, back by um, using the define types that are in the modules, and basically adding another one. Um, this means that we actually take it out the the V host. We take it completely out of. Uh, our puppet code, and we stick it into YAML. So the compulsory YAML programming um, slide. And what we see here is basically the definition of all my, my V hosts. Um, it's a horrible intermediary, but I would like to show it. And then we build, we basically will build towards a situation where we take all our YAML back out, or config, uh, most of our configuration back out of, uh, of YAML and move it into somewhere else. Um, this way, this doesn't work because now we actually have everything in YAML and then stuff like uh, environments becomes really hard to, uh, to maintain. 
because the only way I can get this from, from DEF to UET is basically copy, copying this whole tree into my next environment and then grabbing and setting uh, hopefully all the, the variables that are in, uh, necessary in my production server. So, so actually we break the environments principle in Puppet here if you start doing this. Because the only way to work, make sure that production works in production um, is by copy and pasting. So the first time your code sees, a, uh, sees one of your servers is in production. So this is in, incredibly dangerous. And this also opens you up to, uh, to, uh, to the situation that describes, well, it goes as follows. What happens if your Puppet server loses connection to your higher data? data? Uh, most of your production stuff is in here. Um, probably the address to your Puppet server is in here. Your, your address to the Alk stack is in here. And it's all in your YAML. As soon as you lose connection to um, your high rad data, it basically drops back to the same default you set in your profiles. Uh, I've done this before, that's why this slide is in here. Um, in my high rad backend, I described the Puppet server. Um, I did not have a DNS entry for, for Puppet, which is the, def uh, the name FQDN Puppet, which is the default that. Uh, the server drops back to, so I lost connection to all my nodes. And thank God to other tools like Ansible where we actually could uh, connect them back to the actual Puppet Master. But So if you move stuff out of, out of Puppet into Hira, make sure that if you ever lose connection to Hira, you have a circuit breaker. Um, in your default.pp, add this, this next line, basically look up a key that you know is, is supposed to be there. Um, in here, I, I I actually called it circuit breaker. If this key isn't, isn't in your Hira or it cannot be found or your connection to Hira is down, this will actually uh, explode, pre explode pretty quickly. Your compile doesn't work and um, basically your whole compile stops and nothing changes in your infrastructure anymore. So if you're still in the phase where you are, you're programming YAML, make sure you have your circuit breaker. Next one, uh, this is where um, Puppet, or, well, where Solid really goes off the rails. Uh, it's the let uh, substitution principle. And that says that derived classes must be substitutable for their base class. Uh, we have no working inheritance, uh, no real working inheritance, I should say, in Puppet. It's also uh, uh, considered an anti-pattern for most of the, the inheritance. Um, but let's see how far we can get. For the people that are still in Puppet 3 or uh, don't care, this is a pretty simple piece of uh, Puppet code. Uh, it, has, it has a class uh, Nginx, it de defines a couple of parameters, and we're good as gold. Uh, however, uh, we're not entirely sure if the false is, could be a string, could be a, an actual Boolean, um, what happens if you pass in the string false, but, or the vice versa. So in, I think in Puppet 4, we introduced um, strong typing. Well, it's optional strong typing. But if you opt in, you can actually go in and parse these variables. And you're pretty sure uh, you can determine what, what kind of stuff he, he is allowed to go in. It's very good for validation, because most of the validation stuff we you can now remove from your Puppet code, so you, your code becomes cleaner, but it also becomes very obvious what needs to go in. Everybody that has written or manipulated SSH config knows that um, it, they use on-off instead of zeros and ones. Um, so you always need to parse. Here it's, it's actually pretty simple. So standard lib is the library that we all know. They provide a couple of providers, and then there's the built-in ones. And you can also go pretty deep into the rabbit hole and basically make stuff optional. Uh, so the third one is basically there's a, a list of approved values on and off, uh, but they're, they're, they're optional. So if you set something here, it needs to come off the, uh, the approved list. Um, you're allowed to look, if you zoom into the fourth one, Nginx severity, 
you, sh you actually see you can build quite elaborate type zero yourself without actually having to write a lot of stuff um, into your profiles or into your uh, defined types. And the other bonus is that you can reuse them in multiple modules. So here we go Nginx Severity. It's a, it's a pre-approved list with a, a certain set of, uh, of values. And then we need to make lint happy at the end because uh, lint assumes there needs to be a trailing comma, which in defined types isn't allowed. Uh, this might have been fixed in the meantime, but when, uh, quite recently this was still not allowed, so you need to um, allow for this. Um, next one is the interface segregation principle. Um, make fine-grained inter interfaces that are client-specific. Um, the other way to say this is basically don't repeat yourself. Um, if we look at the Inuit's um, code base and I grab for Apache vhost, I find about 75 instances of this. If I need to um, modify the way we do vhost, I basically need to go through 75 classes and fix them. Um, this seems daft because it sounds like a lot of manual labor, plus manual labor is uh, error prone. Um, and the other reason I mentioned this is relations. So to me, it sounds weird. So that we actually allow profiles that um, have nothing to do with Apache to call directly into the Apache module. We, we, we all discussed that we should use profiles. So we have a profile Apache that uh, if you go to bigger places, individual teams are probably responsible for these profiles. So some team, if you go into corporate structures, do we have a web server team? The web server team is responsible for your profile Apache. Um, we'll have a, another team that wants to run a, an Apache. So it needs to request, um, well, no, it, it, it needs to and it wants to use the profile Apache again. That's the, the approved way our company runs Apache. So we include that. But then again, we allowed people to go basically into Montreal Apache again, bypassing the entire uh, uh, web server team and install a vhost. Um, I might do it the way that is described somewhere in a document. <coughs> it might not be. Um, and then you either have to have uh, people digging through commits or digging through codes for the approved way of doing things. Or in worst cases, we have a, the web server teams assumes everybody does it their way, change something, and then all of a sudden, weird places of your puppetry start breaking. So we shouldn't actually allow people to um, go directly to the, the, the underlying component modules. But that means that we, we actually only should allow people to have uh, call defined types in profiles. So we, we should wrap um, the defined types that are in component modules that are commonly used, uh, wrap them in another defined type in your module, in your profiles. This is a simple uh, relationship tree that you can build off of most of your puppet runs. And this is a very simple one. Uh, but if you make one right now on your your puppet tree, I'm fairly sure you end up with the Death Star of complexity. Whereas stuff calling into different layers of abstraction uh, that don't belong there. Um, so building on that, I don't longer want to see create resource Apache vhost. I want something that basically says if profile Symfony, that's the way we install Symfony applications, and in that, in that uh, profile, I want to install a vhost. And in that vhost, we basically call um, uh, in that profile, we basically call the original Apache, um, well, profile Apache vhost, and uh, some extra code that basically installs our whatever we do for Symfony or for Drupal. Uh, other frameworks are available. 
Uh, basically, for Symfony, at Inuit, we package everything into a native package, so that will be an RPM. Uh, for most Symfony applications and Drupal applications, we'll have a cron job to do something. Uh, we need to have logs need to be rotated. Um, and that actually brings us nicely to the next and the last uh, uh, principle is the dependency inversion. Um, depend on abstractions, not on concretions. So when we look at our original code, we actually split it out a bit already. We'll have somewhere along the line, the firewall profile got extracted and placed on all of our nodes. Um, now, if you want to, um, we also abstracted PHP because Apache and PHP shouldn't be linked. We have enough applications in our infrastructure that basically run uh, headless PHP comp uh, applications, um, which you probably shouldn't, but we still do it because you can. Uh, um, so there was no reason for a long time, we actually on the nodes that had no reason to have an Apache, we had Apache server because that's basically how we got PHP on a node. Um, so we abstract it out, and it also allows us to actually um, uh, do what I described before. So we have, I call the, and this is a static app, but it's, it's the same thing. We have a vhost that does something specific, so it doesn't, it creates an instance for static packages. It's fairly simple. It installs a package, and then it goes back, you go into Apache vhost, and you install your vhost. And if you have a PHP app, there will be a section here where you request a, an, an FPM pool. That's basically your fast CGI implementation. Um, if you go back in there, even your defined types can call defined types or should call defined types. Um, it does your locking. It does uh, installation of other stuff it requires. Um, simple for PHP, it's important, well, it's PHP, so it needs some form of caching, and since FPM is an instance of its, uh, in a pit of its own, we need to have independent cache um, clearance. So here we actually have another, uh, the define type calls another define type that basically installs some configuration about how to clear a cache. And at the bottom we see, we want to ship our logs as, uh, a pool, a FPM pool creates an, a big log. We want to know about the log. Um, so we call actually the, in our case, the profile base, which is a horrible name. Um, we might as well call it core. But that's where we... Sorry. No worries. <laughs> is it beer time? <laughs> Not yet. Okay, almost, almost. So yeah, so here we see we actually... Even in a defined type in a profile, we call another defined type in another profile. This, but we don't, we stay at the same level of abstraction, so we're all good. Um, actually, I'm way out of time. Um, so it is definitely beer time. So if we, if we look at the conclusions, um, we can apply solid somewhat. Uh, the numbers are pretty, uh, may, may change uh, in, whatever you're, you're using. Um, but we can use some of it. Some of it we can use um, not rigidly, but we can at least agree that something should be convention over configuration. Um, so we can um, agree that profiles shouldn't call profiles, but profiles are allowed to call uh, defined types in profiles. Um, so as I'm a converted PHP programmer, this is the book that basically um, is written by a Belgian guy. Uh, it's self-published on LeanPub. Um, and it's, it walks you through the five principles I basically described right now. Uh, yes, so it is heavily PHP, but it should be readable for most, uh, most ops guys. And that's basically me. You want to complain that I send you to beer too early, then uh, email, Twitter, uh, ooh, email, uh, and my phone number, um, <laughs> which has turned up. Um, so yes, thank you.